This is part four of chapter three, The Manipulated Mind by Denise Wynn. Unquestioned Beliefs. We think we decide what we do. In the 1960s, American psychologist Stanley Milgram ran a highly controversial and now much quoted experiment which investigated people's reactions to authority. He wanted to know whether, when asked to carry out a destructive act, but one condoned by a higher authority, people will comply or rebel. Or, more accurately, he wanted to find out at what point people would rebel. <clears throat> the experiment will be discussed more fully later, but in brief, the scenario was as follows. Volunteers of all ages and professions were invited, for a fee, to take part in a study supposedly about the effects of punishment on learning. Volunteers were paired as teacher and learner, although, in fact, the learner was an assistant of the experimenter. The teacher had to teach the learner a long list of word pairs. The learner, if he got one wrong when tested, was to receive an electric shock. The first time he made an incorrect reply, the shock was to be mild in intensity, 15 volts. Every ensuing time that he made a mistake, the intensity was to increase up to a maximum of 450 volts. The teachers were told that the learner couldn't suffer physical harm. Of course, the learner was only seemingly wired up for shocks and didn't really receive any at all. Although to convince the teachers of the genuine nature of the experiment, the, re the experimenter gave each teacher a 45 volt shock just to show him how it felt. However, as the teacher sat operating the switches on the equipment, the learner responded in a prearranged way. When supposedly receiving a 75 volt shock, he grunted in discomfort. At 120 volts, he complained. At 150 volts, he demanded to be released from the experiment. At 285 volts, he emitted an agonized scream and then nothing more was heard from him. As the learner was in in an adjoining room, the teacher had no way of knowing what had happened to him. About 300,000 volunteers were drawn for the experiment in all. Before the experiment began, psychiatrists were asked to predict how far the subjects would go, and the consensus was that only the lunatic fringe would go beyond 150 volts, the tenth of the 300 of the 30 shock levels. The assumptions behind these predictions were, first, that people are for the most part decent and don't like hurting innocent others, and second, that a person is in command of his own behavior and he decides what he will do. To the amazement of Milgram and the psychiatrists alike, no less than 62% of people tested continued to give shocks right up to the 450 volt level. As Milgram, as Milgram was careful to point out, his subjects were a good cross-section of an ordinary population rather than sadists. Most suffered extreme stress while giving the shocks and afterwards couldn't believe they had been capable of doing such a thing. What the assumptions of psychiatrists and experimenters alike had failed to take into account in this experiment was the, that the concept of duty and obedience towards a respected authority has a very deeply entrenched hold on people in general. As Milgram said in his book, Obedience to Authority, this is perhaps the most fundamental lesson of our study. Ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part can become agents in a terrible destructive process. A very treasured assumption that only the few would ever be prevailed upon to carry out actions completely contrary to fundamental standards of morality had to bite the dust. People do not make their own decisions based on their own and collective standards of behavior always because few of the resources to resist resist authority because few have the resources to resist authority circumstances can affect our actions more dramatically than we could ever allow ourselves to believe a more detailed account of the experiment and findings appears in chapter 6 assumptions based on language assumptions may affect behavior in very subtle ways Benjamin Lee Worth has shown that our assumptions about the meanings of words can actually have alarming effects on our actions. He discovered while working for a fire insurance company that many fires started not because of people's carelessnesses, 
but because they misread the situation due to their understanding of words commonly used to describe it. This is article in Language, Culture, and Personality. He found, for instance, that men working in the vicinity of a storage of gasoline drums were conscious of fire hazard and careful of their behavior, but that when around what were designated as empty gasoline drums, their actions might be different. Unrestricted smoking and throwing down of stubs was quite common, yet the empty drums are even more dangerous because they contain explosive vapor. Worf suggests that the problem is people's normal understanding of the word empty. Empty, to the men concerned, meant the drums were null, inert. This is a general formula for the linguistic conditioning of behavior into hazardous forms, says Worf. Another example of language-induced hazardous behavior that he cites occurred in a wood distillation plant where the metal stills were insulated with a substance called spun limestone. No effort was made by the workers to protect this covering from excessive heat or flame. When eventually the fire below one of the stills spread to the limestone, everyone was astounded to see that the limestone burned quite furiously. Because of the exposure to acetic acid fumes from the stills, part of the limestone calcium carbonate had converted to calcium acetate, which, when heated by fire, formed inflammable acetone. Worf suggests that the men in the works were misled in, into thinking that thinking the limestone covered, covering was safe close to flame because of the name limestone. Stone implies non-combustibility. On the same principle, Worf explained the, the accident that happened when a pile of scrap lead was dumped near a coal melting pot used for lead, lead reclaiming. Scrap lead was a, most, a misnomer, said Worf, because it actually consisted of lead sheets of old radio condensers which still had paraffin between them. The paraffin blazed up and burned off half the, of the roof. The label we give to objects and practices can therefore lead us to erroneous assumptions about the nature of those objects and practices. Attributing reason to action. Despite Milgram's findings, we are deeply imbued with the idea that we are in control of our actions and that we know the reason for which we have done them. Psychoanalytic literature is full of examples that might disabuse us of this idea. For example, what Freud termed defense mechanisms is a fruitful area for study. When we are anxious about something we don't want to face, we employ a variety of cover-ups which tend to be so effective that we really consciously do not realize that the motive for an action may be other than it appears to be. So the man who misses an important business meeting because he feels inadequate in the company of that particular group of associates tells himself that he opted out, he opted not to go because he knows that such meetings are a waste of valuable time. Freud termed this rationalization. Another defense mechanism termed termed reaction formation involves going overboard in an opposite direction in, a, in an effort to mask anxiety or guilt from oneself. A woman who finds the children of her neighbors irritating and unappealing may in fact pay them excessive attention, give them sweets, wave away even their grosser misdemeanors in order to hide from herself a deeply buried fear that she is unfeminine and unnatural for not adoring children. While it would be very difficult to, co to coax the man to admit he felt inadequate with his peers or the woman to admit that she disliked children because they genuinely wouldn't re real realize it themselves, the tendency to Im impute some rational explanation to an action is more easy to observe in the case of hypnotized subjects who are given a command to do something at a given time after they have come out of hypnosis. Stage hypnotists often select something trivial designed to amuse the audience, such as asking the subject to scratch his nose vigorously ten minutes after he has returned to his seat. To the delight of the audience, the unsuspecting subject rubs at his nose right on cue, but if asked why he did it, he might say unhesitatingly, unhesitatingly because my nose itched. And I'll stop right there. And we are in chapter three. That was video number four. And this is the manipulated mind. See you in a little bit.